Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, this is actually the first uh, hybrid Grand Rounds that I attend. And uh, today we have the Maxwell McKenzie Endowed Lectureship in Endocrinology. Uh, this is one of the major endowed lectures of uh, the endocrine division and recognizes the contributions of Dr. Max McKenzie to uh, thyroid thyroidology and also to the University of Miami. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Dr. McKenzie uh, made significant contributions uh, in the pathogenesis of Graves' disease and some of the assays that uh, were, were used uh, in the past. And he also came here as uh, a chair of medicine, then as a chief of endocrine and was uh, really involved in training many of the endocrinologists that uh, went through the University of Miami. Uh, this uh, also lecture uh, is uh, supported by the McKenzie family and some of the faculty in the past. And today we have uh, the great pleasure to have Dr. Peter Butler uh, giving the uh, McKenzie lecture and uh, Dr. Ramirez will introduce uh, Dr. Butler. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to introduce our grand round speaker, Dr. Peter Butler. Dr. Butler is a professor of medicine in the division of endocrinology, diabetes, and hypertension at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA in LA, California. He completed his internships in Birmingham, UK, residency at the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. He completed his fellowships at the University of Newcastle in the UK and at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's a renowned researcher with research grants from the Larry Hillblum Foundation and the NIH. He has over 150 peer-reviewed publications and more than 40 book chapters and reviews. Today, he will discuss his research on beta cell loss and diabetes, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Peter Butler to Grand Rounds. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, so um, yes, when I first arrived at Mayo Clinic um, in 1987, I spoke with even more of an English accent than I do now. And one of my first patients I called to give, get a result and the daughter took message. And when the mom came home, the daughter told her that some doctor from Mayo Clinic called, um, and he didn't speak very good English. And I think his name was Peanut Butter. <laughs> <laughs> So as a consequence, I go back and give a lecture once a year at Mayo Clinic, and I'm always still introduced as peanut butter. So uh, Maxwell McKenzie um, as a Scot, I did, as you just heard, a part of my training was in Scotland, and I actually was on the faculty at the University of Edinburgh for three years, and proud to say I started the Caledonian Endocrine Society. So I think he would approve of that. And certainly the group that he started here and that is now under management by Ernesto and, and team is a very impressive one. And so the history of diabetes uh, accomplishments here is, is really uh, impressive. And I'm sure he would be very proud of what you have done with his legacy. I'm clicking and nothing is happening. It happened, it happened before. Oh, there we go. So for this audience, I hardly have to uh, uh, advertise the importance of diabetes, but just very briefly, type 1 diabetes, uh, you know, is a lifelong and altering, life-altering disease that uh, often comes on in childhood. Um, it, life depends on injection of insulin. Uh, the kids have to go through adolescence, so dating, school sports, disentanglement from parents who are terrified, letting them go away to college. And then, of course, they finally get out of all that. And in our crazy healthcare insurance system, they're now in all kinds of trouble trying to pay for this insulin, pay for all the stuff, terrified of losing insurance. And then type 2 diabetes, um, we keep hearing about it being a worldwide epidemic, which, of course, it is. Sadly, often presenting with the macrovascular complications before diagnosis. Uh, high costs, again, both to the patients and society commonest reason for renal dialysis, at least in our institution now, is patients with type 2 diabetes. And social stigma, which I think we in the medical profession have played a fairly large part in 
and it's one of the things I'm going to try and address today. So before I get into the nitty gritty of what I want to talk about diabetes, just a quick reminder of the regulation of blood sugar and health. Um, that was not meant to happen. There we go. Um, I tell my patients that basically your blood sugar is maintained by an air conditioning system and a thermostat, just like your temperature at home. So the blood glucose is maintained in narrow limits in health. At the middle of the night, you're burning about 200 milligrams every minute, and 100, 100 of that's being used by the brain, 100 elsewhere. Blood sugar is being maintained by the liver, releasing glucose at an appropriate rate to match the uptake of glucose. And of course, the pancreatic islets uh, are measuring the glucose and they're secreting insulin directly into the hepatic portal vein in discrete secretory bursts about every four minutes, uh, very much like the hypothalamic pituitary axis, in fact, and we'll touch on this a little bit more, but these insulin secretory bursts act to constrain hepatic glucose release. So we have the thermostats and we have the AC, as it were, for the liver. And <clears throat> one of the reasons that um, Dr. McKenzie was very smart to choose the thyroid, and I was perhaps pretty stupid to choose the pancreas, is access. So your chair of medicine, when he's interested in the thyroid, takes out a little needle and pokes it in someone's neck, and he gets a piece of tissue. If I wanted to get a piece of tissue out of the pancreas, it has to be a very long needle. And even then, uh, the pancreas is like most departments of medicine, 99% of it goes to GI and 1% to endocrinology. So only 1% of this organ is islets. So we would have a pretty low likelihood of hitting an islet. But there are 1 million of them scattered around in the pancreas with two to 3,000 beta cells illustrated here, stained for insulin. So that <clears throat> most adult humans have about a gram worth of beta cells uh, distributed and scattered across the, the pancreas. And if we go down to the ultrastructural level, here are these densely packed uh, beta cells closely uh, associated, they act in a syncytium, the secretory vesicles ready to come out upon stimulation. Um, and beta cells as a cell type really have to work very hard. Typical adult human, if we do simple maths, uh, uh, synthesizes about 20 million pro-insulin molecules a day. That's if you're lean and insulin sensitive and have your full complement of beta cells. About 15 million of those are secreted and about 5 million failed quality control in the ER and are cleared by the uh, proteasome or autophagy pathways. And just like neurons and retinal cells, uh, beta cells, once you are an adult, you pretty much have what you're gonna get for most of your life. So these uh, beta cells for decades are having to express and process 20 million uh, molecules a day or more. And it's very, these pathways for clearing waste are very critical for the survival of these cells, uh, all cell types, neurons, retinal cells, and indeed beta cells. And we'll touch on this a little bit later. So I it touched on the fact that these secretory vesicles are popping out in a pulsatile fashion, and that's illustrated in this next slide that shows hepatic portal vein insulin concentrations measured minute by minute. Uh, in yeah. the state, I'm gonna uh, just go grab a meal. Yeah, yeah. I gotta go grab it from Paneer. So however long that takes. When the arrow illustrates mixed meal, and the, what you can see indeed is that the portal vein insulin concentration oscillates about a thousand picomoles per liter every four minutes. And then there's, after a meal, there's a marked amp increase in the size of those pulses. The frequency doesn't change. It looks like it does, but it's just because they're superimposed on each other. So the regulation of insulin secretion is to amplify these, these very large secretory bursts. So <clears throat> is this important? Well, I mentioned the hypothalamic pituitary axis, and indeed it is important. These secretory pulses are coming up the portal vein here, and the anatomy of the liver, if you remember, is uh, wide open spaces within the vasculature uh, sinusoids. So the hepatocytes see these pulses. And upon arrival, 80, uh, the insulin uh, receptors are sitting on the cell membrane. The uh, insulin interacts with the receptor and the insulin receptor complex is endocytosed. Uh, the insulin signaling occurs over about two minutes. And then the receptor comes back to the cell surface, dumps the 
split products of insulin that have been uh, then cleared and their receptors ready for the next burst that's going to come along. And so if you treat your patient with injected insulin into the subcutaneous space, which of course we do, it's a far cry from giving insulin into the portal vein every four minutes. So when we inject insulin peripherally, it's inevitable that it doesn't work as well. You just simply can't get it to work as well as it arriving every four minutes. And as one of the things we're gonna to come to, patients with type one diabetes are equally as insulin resistant as patients with type two diabetes if you match them for body mass index, something not always appreciated because the abnormal delivery of insulin uh, facilitates that. All right, enough for the quick primer of, of <clears throat> insulin secretion in health. What about diabetes? So type one diabetes, when I was chief resident 110 years ago, uh, patients would show up in the hospital, um, typically, you know, a 19 year old, had a flu-like illness a week ago, um, then now started developing intense thirst and polyuria and uh, comes in with DKA and we treat the patient and what we were told was that that viral illness a week ago must have prompted the immune system to make a mistake. It's killed the beta cells. And here's your patient now with DKA, no beta cells. Um, it always seemed a little strange that there would be a virus with an epitope that would just match beta cells. I remember being suspicious about that. There were researchers running around the hospital grabbing samples from these patients to try and figure out which virus was causing type 1. And of course, we now know that that was all, um, frankly, very misguided. Um, this gentleman illustrated here, George Eisenbach, uh, re-educated us or was one of several, but a leader in this field by taking blood samples from uh, not identical twins that were discordant for type one diabetes over time when he was at Jocelyn. He started the process of defining the time course of type one diabetes. And so, <clears throat> What he found, of course, was that there were often years, even 10 years between the onset of autoimmunity and finally patients developing clinical diabetes. And over time, these got broken into stages, stage one being the onset of type one diabetes, stage two, you can detect abnormal glucose uh, metabolism. If you do a glucose tolerance test, it's abnormal, but the patient still doesn't know they have diabetes, they're asymptomatic, and then stage three is when they actually show up with diabetes. Um, I think we made a minor contribution to helping with all this because George did come to visit us when we were collecting pancreases from patients that sadly had died uh, of type 1 diabetes um, at the time of presentation without getting uh, so new onset type 1 diabetes uh, preserved by the Mayo Clinic archives. And what we found was, was interesting and surprising is illustrated here. In the top panel is a low power immunohistochemistry for insulin of pancreas sections and people who just died of type one diabetes recent onset and then higher power sections at the bottom. And what you can see is that in some lobules in the pancreas, there essentially looks like almost normal uh, complement of beta cells shown in brown here and higher power can see these islets. Some of them you can see there's an infiltrate of, uh, of lymphocytes and then other areas of the pancreas, mm -hmm. same pancreas, there would be literally no uh, beta cells within the islets, the islets were empty maybe one beta cell here or there. And this, <clears throat> George looked at it and told us, well, basically what you've shown us is that the pancreas is developing a similar pattern as this autoimmune condition of vitiligo, that you are gradually losing lobule by lobule um, beta cells from the pancreas. It's not all going simultaneously. And this partly explains the slow time course as much as 10 years between the onset and, and the development of diabetes. So at this point, we were interested, what would happen if you actually lost half of your beta cells? Because this is what we were seeing in these new onset type ones who, who died. And we did a, uh, an experimental um, measurement of this by doing partial pancreatectomies versus sham surgeries in, in a dog model. Dogs, because we were able to get enough blood to do the insulin secretion studies we wanted to do. And so that's illustrated in the next, this next slide where we decreased the beta cell mass by 50% in half of the animals and just did sham surgery in the others. When you do that, you end up with what we now would call pre-diabetes, um, subtle hyperglycemia, not diabetes. But when we looked at the portal vein insulin secretion in the fasting state shown in the lower panel, uh, in the dogs that had the full complement of pancreas, you see the 
and excursions in black. And the dogs that, an example of a dog that had half a pancreas removed, the pulses are just normal in frequency. They're just half the size they should be. When you feed the animal a mixed meal, what you see is they have profound glucose intolerance, which is what you see in patients with type one diabetes in that second phase of uh, the, of <clears throat> the evolution of diabetes. So they've lost about half their beta cells. They don't yet know they have diabetes. If you measure the blood sugar, it's, it's in the pre-diabetes phase, but they have marked glucose intolerance. And now what you can see, the scales changed, no, eight, uh, 3000 versus 800. The portal vein insulin concentration as expected increases markedly in the normal dogs after you fed them a meal. But if you've reduced the insulin, the beta cell mass by 50%, there's a failure to be able to increase the insulin pulse mass, the size of these little bursts, they cannot increase appropriately and hence the marked glucose intolerance. And furthermore, when we measured insulin sensitivity in these animals by clamps, these animals had hepatic insulin resistance as a consequence of the abnormal insulin delivery. So this really illustrates the fact that in your patients with type one diabetes, this is occurring also. Edwin Gale many years ago showed the pulses were abnormal in the early phases of type one diabetes and various groups originally de Fronzo about 20 years ago, have shown that patients with type 1 diabetes do have comparable insulin resistance to type 2 if you match for body mass index. So again, if you looked at the islets of where there were, <clears throat> was infiltration in these uh, patients with new onset type 1 diabetes, as expected, where we see a few beta cells left shown here in green, um, alpha cells in blue. These red is the invading lymphocytes stain for, anti for CD3, uh, and of course, <clears throat> this has been an area of, of, of known for many years and efforts to try to do something to preserve the beta cells that are still present, since as many as 50% of them are present at onset of type 1 diabetes, has been a long-standing target in the field of type 1 diabetes. <clears throat> and I think 10 days ago, maybe two weeks ago, finally, the first uh, FDA-approved um, drug has become marketed uh, teplizumab, it's an anti-CD3 antibody. I treated my first patient the day before I came on this trip, so I think I'm pretty fast out of the hatch. Uh, it's an FDA approved for type two, stage two type one diabetes. So in this phase, you found they have autoantibodies, they don't yet have symptomatic diabetes, and published in the New England Journal a couple of years back now, if this is used in that phase, you delay the onset of type one diabetes by three or four years. Doesn't sound like very much, but if you're a five-year-old, not getting diabetes for another three or four years is a pretty big deal. And I think <clears throat> Kevin Harrell takes a lot of credit for fighting this through and getting it um, onto approved. Kevin rather articulately points out, this is analogous in his mind to the first steps in immunotherapy for cancer, which were, had modest effects, but at least began a whole new area of therapy, which we now all know is pretty impressive of what's happened. And I think that Kevin is probably right that now that this has been launched, there will be further efforts. And we maybe will, the fact we have it available will help us set up a system like they have in Germany already to screen kids for these autoantibodies can just be done on a single finger prick. Uh, find the kids or young adults that are in fact in this stage of pre-type 1 diabetes and begin uh, maybe additional therapies to try to prolong uh, survival of beta cells. So for, <clears throat> for Dr. McKenzie, I think it should be recognized that University of Miami played a big role in this whole story because uh, um, the trial net program that was set up to explore the possibilities of introducing interventions here was led for a long time by Jay Schuyler and uh, uh, <clears throat> it really was sort of marshaled and run from, from this institute for a long time. Well, so much for trying to prevent diabetes in people who are on stage two, what about all of our patients of which there are millions who already have type one diabetes? I'm sure they ask you, they ask me, when can I get my beta cells back? And so of course that's an area of active interest and I'm gonna show one photograph here with a number of players. David Sutherland, of course, at University of Minnesota marshaled the original efforts to do whole pancreas transplants, which um, have become really quite a successful therapy for patients who are, need a pancreas, trans need a kidney transplant and get a pancreas at the same time. 
and it tends to often will work in, if done by technically skilled surgeon for uh, many years and, and indeed helps to prevent further uh, disease in the transplanted kidney. <clears throat> um, and then have Paul Lowry, who from Washington University uh, uh, pioneered the idea of isolating the islets from the pancreas and showed that they're transplanted into the liver of rats could reverse diabetes, so they didn't need to have the whole pancreas. Many surgeons have been trying to pioneer this to humans, and so for local expediency, I show your very own Camilo Ricordi here, looking debonair as ever, next to a microscope. I'm not sure if he knows what that is, but that's a microscope. <laughs> Camilo. <laughs> Sorry, Camilo. Um, and, uh, and, and <clears throat> down here is a young man who's a personal friend of mine, uh, Doug Melton, who uh, dropped the Xenopus as, a, as an organ of investigation once his two kids, Sam, and Emma developed type 1 diabetes and did an amazing job in learning how to marshal uh, stem cells into functional pancreatic islets. Uh, and this, as you, many, many have heard at the ADA last year, has now finally gone into humans. The first human was off insulin uh, presented last year, uh, and I'm sure more has gone on. And again, here we begin to see the reversal of diabetes. Uh, your <clears throat> institution here is part of that program. And I think the future here is going to be of an interaction between immune intervention and cell therapy because these cells have to be immunoprotected still so that these two areas of work, I think, are going to interplay uh, and we'll find ways of both delaying onset of type 1 diabetes and reversing it. Uh, so an exciting time for young residents to think about being endocrinologists because it's going to be really exciting. You don't get paid much, but you have a lot of fun and it's an important disease. Um, before I leave this, just again to remind, just to re-emphasize to the group, partly because I wrote the question that you have to do for your CME, but partly also because I think it's worth knowing that when you're giving insulin the way we have to, these folks are equally insulin resistant as type two diabetics. So beta cell failure causes insulin resistance. It isn't just the other way around. It's important to know. And we also know that islet transplantation into the liver after a few um, years, the islets cross communicate to each other through an intral neural network in the liver. And there's coordinate uh, pulsatility within that liver and the patient regains insulin sensitivity. So that's an interesting caveat to the intra liver transplants. All right, so switching to type two diabetes. So type two diabetes, as I mentioned, I think we've contributed a little bit to the stigma that goes with it. Um, and I'm obviously here to propose the fact that it's not all the patient's fault partly and that implicate the beta cell playing a role. So <clears throat> what I was told in 1980, when I graduated from med school, this was caused by obesity, insulin resistance, and the implication was really, it was the patient's own fault and they had it coming to them because you know if you, uh, one of the mortal sins illustrated here in a wood painting from the 1300s is gluttony. And there's a certain sort of whole um, anxiety about the fact that oh dear, I got this and, and I went to Google and it tells me I got it because I deserved it, et cetera. And many of you who take care of patients with diabetes know that patients with type two diabetes, thanks to a lot of what's written down, much of it incorrect, come along quite tail between their legs, convinced that somehow they've, they've brought this on themselves. So the cartoon that I, if I push our <clears throat> residents, and they'll tell me, well, it's obesity and it's diabetes. And if I push and push, they'll eventually put, well, maybe the islets fail in there somewhere. Not sure why, but uh, who knows? And it's, but it's all obesity and insulin resistance. And, and a lot of this came, I think, via a, a little animal that did a great deal to push our field backwards, the DBDB mouse. So the DBDB mouse is leptin deficient and eats itself into a state that it can hardly move anymore, as illustrated here. Uh, Steve O'Reilly in Cambridge, I think, has found six leptin deficient families. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes are not leptin deficient, and you inject them with leptin, it doesn't do anything whatsoever for them. So this model really has very little to do with type 2 diabetes, but it's been widely used. It is true now, if you approach a pharmaceutical company with something that does well in a DBDB mouse, they'll kick you out before you've even got through the door, because they're so sick of the failures in that model. That model coined the term that it was pancreas fat that's causing the islets to fail. And the term glucolipotoxicity uh, toxicity is thrown around. And so have the lipids that are accumulating because of this 
in big diet are causing the um, failure. So we asked that question, do, is more fat in the pancreas actually predictive of people developing type two? So we basically went to all the CT scans being done at UCLA one after the other, separated people who did and didn't have type two diabetes and looked at the pancreatic fat. And that's illustrated here. So fat volume versus the BMI. So um, red dots diabetes, green dots non-diabetes. You can see, not surprisingly, if you've become more obese, on average, you probably have more fat in your pancreas. There's a lot of variability at any particular BMI. But the, the, the best fit lines between these populations completely overlap. And you can see there's really zero um, uh, separation. The person with the most fat in the pancreas here is a non-diabetic, and the person with the least is a diabetic. In humans, at least, you cannot, you cannot implicate fat in the pancreas as being the cause of type 2 diabetes. There's, uh, also, no data from the prospective studies that have looked at people at risk of developing diabetes who did and who didn't from the circulating lipids. So neither fat in the pancreas nor circulating fat is predictive of people who are or are not going to develop diabetes. So that's one myth busted. What about insulin resistance? Is the insulin resistance from the obesity enough to cause type 2 diabetes? So I'm going to go all the way back to Ken Polonsky's studies way, way ago from 1988, where he brought in a series of people into the clinical research center at the University of Chicago and <clears throat> measured their insulin secretion over 48 hours, fed them meals uh, using C-peptide deconvolution. And the data is shown here. So the body mass index from the lean through to the obese, somebody up here at 55 BMI. And as you can see, there's a graded increase in insulin secretion per 24 hours with obesity because obesity does cause insulin resistance. But the point really to show this slide is, look, here's someone with a BMI of 55 secreting you know, 10 times as much as in insulin as this person down here doesn't have diabetes. And in fact, 80% of people who are morbidly obese, lifelong, never develop diabetes. Internists, you give lots of people steroids for one reason or another. Most of them become very insulin resistant. When you do it, they, most of them don't develop diabetes, a subset do. Women during the third trimester of pregnancy become very insulin resistant because they want the baby to grow preference in, rather than them at the same speed. They don't all get diabetes. A subset do, about 20%, but 80% don't. So the general notion here is most of us do not get diabetes when we get insulin resistant. And we go back to Dr. McKenzie as a classical endocrinologist, he might remind you of what happens in patients with chronic renal failure. They have low ionized calcium, as a consequence of the buffering of the bicarb. So the parathyroid glands are stimulated, they're chronically stimulated. Do they fail? No, they get bigger. They get bigger and they make more and more parathyroid hormone. Uh, take out the adrenal glands, the anterior pituitary gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so-called Nelson syndrome. So endocrine um, systems generally don't fail when they're asked to work hard. They don't have a trade union. So a cartoon here is to say that all of the different causes of insulin resistance in 80% of us in this room would result in us not getting diabetes, but secreting a lot of insulin, just like Ken Polonsky showed us all those years ago. In contrast, there's a subset of us, about 20% of us, who under those conditions would not increase insulin secretion adequately and actually have a progressive decline in insulin secretion. And then hidden behind the zoom, I think it, they also become more insulin resistant. So you're insulin resistant for one of these reasons, but if you're in the wrong branch and you're unlucky and you become diabetic, as beta cells fail, just like in type one diabetes, you then become even more insulin resistant than you were for whatever the original cause was. So clearly this suggests that we better look at the pancreas to see what's going on. And that's basically what I did all those years ago when I was at Mayo Clinic. I was fortunate because Mayo Clinic has collected and kept a piece of the pancreas of every patient they've done an autopsy on since 1908. And they've done so uh, um, in an archived fashion where they've kept the clinical records. So they have literally this huge warehouse where they have heart, pancreas, liver, spleen, kidney from every single autopsy. They also do autopsies on the same day of death, Saturday, Sunday, whatever, in contrast to UCLA when the, or seems to happen a couple of weeks later. And the advantage of this, of course, is the pancreas tends to undergo autolysis quickly. So these samples are in good shape. Um, they also, because they have an integrated medical record, what we could do was go identify individuals in one of these two groups 
who had had a general medical exam done a year before death, sometime during the preceding year. So we weren't relying on a hospital glucose to say diabetic or non-diabetic, but they walked into a clinic somewhere, had blood as an ambulatory clinic visit, and then we restricted our patients to be in the study to had sudden death. So we didn't have people who were mapped, for example, losing weight for reasons of cancer or whatever that so might influence the, the weight versus findings. And we see a pathology. So the, again, the healthy islet shown at the top, two to 3,000 beta cells, a typical islet in people with type 2 diabetes, there was clearly less beta cells. And this, this amyloid here, which we'll get back to. And so when we quantified this, um, long-standing type 2 diabetes that lose about 65% or have 65% deficit. I have to be careful not to say lose because you don't have more than one autopsy. So we don't know what these people had before, right? But there's a 65% deficit in beta cells here. In contrast, long-standing type 1 diabetes, by now it's pretty much all gone. So <clears throat> it becomes more um, helpful really to look at the data if we plotted individual dots uh, and versus because we had this unique data set of the fasting plasma glucose sometime during the year before. So let's look at the open circles first. And one of the things we learned from these data is there's a very wide range, six fold range in beta cell mass in healthy individuals. So this is something that I think is going to become increasingly important as we understand who is at risk for type two diabetes. Look at the individuals who at that time was called impaired fasting glucose. Now it's called prediabetes. They're all clustered over here at the bottom end. So if you had a low uh, beta cell mass, you were relatively so-called at risk for developing type two, type two diabetes. And then even a very small further decrease, and we only included patients here who were, only, were not on a glucose lowering therapy, because otherwise we couldn't measure the glucose versus beta cell mass. We see this steep increase and loss of control. This is a European journal, I apologize, multiply by 18 if you want, but this is normal glucose and up here is obviously high glucose. So basically there's this curvilinear relationship that seems to have a break point at about 50%. Well, you remember the dog study? If you take away 50% of the beta cells, what happens? You begin to lose the size of those bumps that are seen hitting the liver. The liver becomes insulin resistant. You have insulin resistance, you decrease the number of cells that you have available you have a vicious cycle, you start to now have um, a beta cell deficit and insulin secretion deficit and insulin resistance as a consequence of it. And this appears to at least play a role in this decompensation. <clears throat> so in just to show what it looks like in a patient with type two diabetes, it's one of our recent studies here for type two, the plasma glucose in non-diabetics before and after a meal, before a meal, after a mixed meal, rapidly back to normal within two hours by definition, prompt insulin secretion in response to that meal within 15 minutes of the uh, in eating the meal. C-peptide as a measure of insulin secretion is already rapidly rising. And the big difference is in patients with type two diabetes, not only is there um, <clears throat> a defect in insulin secretion in the basal state, I say defect, there's no significant difference here in the fasting state between the controls and the type twos, but the type twos are hyperglycemic. So the should be higher glucose. This was shown by Perley and Kipnis 60 years ago. But <clears throat> the big defect is after a meal ingestion. Just like I showed you, you can't increase those pulses. Now you're unable to mount a response and therefore you have this marked glucose intolerance. And despite the glucose being so high, the insulin secretion is, is really uh, minimal. So, <clears throat> What I've told you about type 2 diabetes so far is there's clearly a deficit of beta cells, about 65% on average. But if we look at the relationship between the beta cell the number in individuals uh, and who gets diabetes, it seems that there's a break point at about 50%. So then the big question is, well, why are the beta cells deficient in type 2? And is this material here, this amyloid, anything to do with it? Uh, we obviously think it is. This amyloid was uh, identified as consisting of a protein called islet amyloid polypeptide, also called amylin by some, uh, by a group in Minnesota and a group in uh, Oxford, England. And the, once it was identified, it was by co-staining shown to be uh, expressed along with insulin by pancreatic beta cells. And interestingly, if you become insulin resistant, the relative expression of IPP goes up. So in healthy lean individuals, you secrete 
that you express about one molecule of IPP per 100 of insulin, and that ratio changes to uh, one molecule of IPP for 10 in, with insulin resistance. And here is the IPP. Uh, in different species, the amino and carboxy, re carboxy regions is identical between species, but shown in pink is the business end. This is the area of the peptide that is prone to forming aggregates. Interestingly, this AILS here is 100% identical to the area of forming aggregates in amyloid beta protein in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> and in fact, if you mix IPP and amyloid beta protein, they'll form amyloid together. You'll note that this pink area is very similar in humans, monkeys, and cats, and these are the three species that develop type 2 diabetes. In contrast, rodents have three proline residues in this region, and the IPP is water-soluble and does not form aggregates. So if you have basically AILS in your IPP, you are a species that has vulnerability to type 2 diabetes. If you don't, you don't. So it's a pretty high indication that this might be important. There are also genetic examples where there are single point mutations here, uh, rare but, but well reported in Japan, where it increases the amyloidogenicity of this peptide, and those families develop type 2 diabetes at a young age onset. So we have genetic background, we have molecular background. So once this was <clears throat> Uh, uncovered, it became obvious that the thing to do would be to stick the human gene into the rodents and see if we could reproduce the disease. And we and others did that. I'm going to talk more about this at endocrine grand rounds tomorrow, but I'll show one example here. So again, this is the human non-diabetic and type 2 diabetic. This is a human, this is a sprague dolly rat stained for insulin. And then this is a sprague dolly rat expressing human IPP. In mid-rat life, they develop diabetes, they have island amyloid, they have a relative beta cell deficit. Interestingly, they develop hepatic insulin resistance at the point when they've lost 50% of the beta cells. And let's see, Matt Bianco in our lab did the um, impressive task of measuring portal vein insulin positility, and then they lose the positivity amplitude at the same time as they develop hepatic insulin resistance. So there's a really quite a reasonable model for type 2 diabetes. As I say, I'll talk more about it tomorrow, but to cut a long story short, the amyloid is not the cause of the problem. As we showed early on in these studies, and of course, the Alzheimer's people are finding out the hard way by keeping getting negative studies trying to clear the amyloid. The problem, in fact, is intracellular aggregates that have the molecular basis of which has been solved. This appeared behind the Zoom, uh, uh, <clears throat> but um, it, it was published in Science. And there are six uh, sigmas. And what happens is these form in the membrane, particularly in the endoplasmic membrane and they cause a non-selective ion channel. So there's calcium leakage from ER into the cytosol, causing calpane hyperactivation. It's been shown both in beta cells in type two, neurons in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And <clears throat> that's the beginning of, of the sequence of problems. More of that tomorrow. So this point, usually what happens is people ask me nervously, well, am I in the 80 or am I in the 20%? How do I know? I, I, I couldn't care less about anything else you've just been saying. I just want to make sure I'm on the right side here. So uh, for that reason, I will wind up here to help you decide whether you're on the 80 or the 20% side. So <clears throat> I think this is where your um, division chief, I think, is working with his team on, on gold in this regard, because he's been a leader in understanding that what goes on in pregnancy and during development probably defines the beta cell numbers that you have, and that, I believe, is going to be a critical determinant of whether you're in the 80 or the 20. So what I'm showing you here is work done by Uris Meyer when he was in our lab, as ever, dipping into this amazing, amazing Mayer resource. And every dot on this graph is a tragedy. They're children who died, usually traumatic deaths. And we have the pancreas to measure the beta cell uh, numbers. And it divided into quintiles of age. I apologize. The age disappeared behind the, the controls here. But basically, these are the newborns uh, aged two to five years, five to 14, 14 to, and so forth. And the point of the graph, the graph is what Uris has done is he's plotted the individual dots. Because I showed you earlier, there's a six-fold range in beta cell mass between non-diabetic adult humans. We've also shown it, by the way, in pigs, in monkeys, in dogs, and rats. So this is not just human. So <clears throat> I, I told you that a, in a lean, healthy individual beta, uh, beta cell has to express about 20 million pro-insulin molecules a day. 
Well, imagine if you are this lucky individual in blue, well, not lucky because he died a traumatic death, but had he lived long enough, instead of 20 million, it would be something like 5 million because he has substantially more beta cells than the mean. But down here, it's going to be having to go for about 40, maybe 60 million pro insulin molecules a day. So the workload on beta cells is going to be sixfold difference between blue and red because there's a sixfold difference in beta small mass if the number of if the insulin uh, requirement is the same. This spread, therefore, has potential interest if we think about it now in the context of the known risk factors for type 2 diabetes. So in this cartoon, I'm showing you theoretically a, a vertical scale, the amount of insulin plus IPP a beta cell has to make for 24 hours. And <clears throat> The dotted line represents a threshold for how much that cell can do without being overwhelmed, cannot clear the misfolded proteins through autophagy in the proteasome. And every cell has that threshold. You can, if you're a cell biologist, take any cell you like and overexpress a sticky protein in it. And if you do that in a gene dose response curve, you'll hit a point where you kill the cell. You've overwhelmed the cell with misfolded proteins. And if it's an amyloidogenic protein, it'll happen a lot quicker because they form holes in these membranes and you lose calcium uh, uh, compartmentalization. As we age, our capacity for clearing misfolded proteins declines because the proteasome declines, as does autophagy. And that's, of course, why misfolded protein diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are diseases of aging, as indeed is type 2 diabetes. There's one of our risk factors. So this is declining in all of us as we age. In addition, about a third of the genome-wide association studies are implicated in protein folding, chaperoning ER function. So a lot of the GWAS is for type 2 diabetes is here. And interestingly, that same GWAS overlaps identically many of the same genes with Alzheimer's disease, always been a source of interest. So the same genes, same role with misfolded protein protection. POPs, persistent organic pesticides accumulating in our environment. You get a fish out in the middle of the Pacific. Now they have them. These are sprayed on, chemical, on, your, on your lettuce so that the farmer doesn't have to do it twice. When he waters the lettuce, they're still there. Trouble is when you wash your lettuce, they're still there. You eat a little bit of it. It killed the uh, animal that was going to eat the lettuce. It doesn't kill you immediately, but it accumulates in your fat. And it's been shown quite convincingly these are inhibitory on the uh, proteasome. That's how they kill the insects and unfortunately us. So now I'm showing you insulin resistance as a, a, a recognized uh, risk factor of type 2 diabetes. We know that, greater weight, pregnancy, steroids. So GWAS aging, all of these in red are known risk factors for type 2 diabetes. The person with a very high beta cell mass, as he or she becomes insulin resistance, is going to increase workload. But now imagine that the individual who had the, the much lower beta cell mass at when lean and young had sixfold greater requirement, but as getting older, bigger, put on steroids, getting pregnant, there's a much greater risk this person's going to overlap the, the threshold for protein folding. What distinguishes between low and high birth weight mass? Well, GWAS again comes in. About a third of the GWAS for type 2 are known to be important in beta cell development. Low birth weight is a known risk factor for type 2 diabetes and also has been shown recently by one of our former postdocs in Japan uh, from surgical samples, patients that had low birth weight have low beta cell mass as adults. And then for local signaling, thyroid signaling has been shown to be really important in development of beta cell mass, both during pregnancy and this postnatal growth. So I put that one in for Dr. McKenzie and our, our boss here, that the thyroid is important. I, I'm, I always agreed it was. So, we can combine, uh, just go back, we can, most of the risk factors for type 2 diabetes are explained by this vulnerability. So it becomes then pretty important probably to figure out how, on, on, if we can identify who has this low innate beta cell mass. Furthermore, now for the last two slides, I just want to have a clinical correlate for, the, for those of us who see patients. So once again, here we have the insulin secretion required per day of the vertical scale, Insulin resistance shown here, perhaps to be BMI, but could be anything else. The brown line is a theoretical threshold for being able to 
uh, cope, make insulin and not be in trouble. And the brown dot is a patient who's just walked into clinic with a BMI of 48 and new onset type two diabetes. So what does this mean? Well, when this patient arrives, often a younger patient, morbidly obese, new onset type two diabetes, the good news is with new onset type two diabetes, um, they probably still have a pretty high capacity for insulin secretion. They're at the early stage and they probably have a lot of beta cells. So for this patient, if you can get the weight down, particularly perhaps with the new GLP-1 agonists, you're gonna cross over this threshold and they'll probably even for a time, maybe not even have diabetes anymore or certainly be much better off. What I use this for particularly is I draw this cartoon for the patient and I explain to them, you know, 80% of people at your weight don't get diabetes. You do not have diabetes because you're badly behaved. You have diabetes because you have bad luck. You chose to inherit wonderful genes from your mom and dad, but unfortunately you picked up some collection of genes that were not ideal. That's why your ability to make insulin in the setting of what you need is not what it should be. But look, here's my diet, draw this cartoon. If we could get you down here, wow, you probably wouldn't have diabetes for a while or even be much better. So you're, I'm incentivizing the patient, not with guilt, but more with the carrot and explaining this would be a, oh, this is an opportunity we could, should jump on if we can. And in my experience, if you use it that way around, it's much more often works. If you threaten them that they're fat and obese and it serves them right, they go off and eat a burger and never see you again. So I just show this as a, as a way to try and coach your patients. In contrast, particularly in uh, our Asian patients on the West Coast, we see a lot of lean type two diabetes where they show up with BMI, maybe 21, 23, and already quite hyperglycemic. So this patient is the one where you have to, often they don't want insulin, but they need it. And I can show the same graph and draw the little sketch and say, look, you know, it's not your fault. It's real bad luck, but we don't have anywhere to go here hardly we do need to give you some insulin because otherwise we're gonna be in trouble. No, don't go to SGL2 inhibitor because you'll be at high risk of DKA. At least don't do it without insulin. So this cartoon enables us to sort of, you know, temper patients a little bit more in terms of their state versus the choice of therapies. So to summarize, the type one diabetes, I think there's been a tremendous breakthroughs in the last few years. The immune therapy era has started. I think it's gonna get a lot better. Hopefully the cell therapy has started. Miami was involved, heavily involved in this, is heavily involved in this. And so thank you on behalf of patients, University of Miami, you've, you've contributed significantly to the story. And I think it's gonna be an important one going forward. For the purposes of, of teaching, yes, insulin resistance is present in these patients as they develop diabetes because the pattern of insulin secretion is abnormal. For type two diabetes, it is a disease of beta cell deficiency. I don't know why they only lose um, 65 percent and they're left with it. there's something about these beta cells that are survivors that's interesting and unmet unmet uh, response i think that from work i've heard this morning there may be local work that might begin to explain that um, <clears throat> that the number of beta cells you have at the end of your um, childhood probably defines to a large extent your risk and and once you lose any more if you're in the unfortunate group plus become insulin resistant for any reason this tends to bring on the diabetes. Where you develop it in the time course probably defines whether you have you know, a good beta cell reserve or not left. So I think this is what Dr. McKenzie would say as a thyroidologist who in Edinburgh, Scotland, where I spent time, the endocrinologists looked upon diabetologists as second-rate citizens. I'm not sure that that's still the case, but they certainly used to. So he would might say catch up diabetologists. Yes, it's hypoinsulinism and glucose is your bioassay. So basically, if you have diabetes, by definition, you don't have enough insulin. It may be different reasons for it and different causes and different amounts, but it, it's a beta cell disease. Uh, and ultimately we have different ways of getting around that. But my theme is you don't have enough beta cells working if you have diabetes. So with that, thank you to you for the honor of speaking on behalf of the family of Maxwell McKenzie. Thank you, Dr. Butler. That was a real tour de force. It was a beautiful, very clear. I'm not sure 
how many converts we have in the audience uh, to endocrinology from this, but if we even have one, that'll be one more beta cell that will uh, prevent diabetes. So uh, while I don't, I can't see the chat if there's any uh, questions. Okay, so, um, and please be sure, those of you that are in the room to get your MEC and CME credit, MOC and CME credit, uh, there's a, Rorschach sign at the outside of the uh, of, of the building where you can check on your iPhone. Okay, great. So um, first of all, I, starting with the the first part of your your talk, the uh, the immune modulator that you're giving for the type one diabetics you just gave uh, two weeks ago to your first patient. How did you select that patient? That's a great question. I think. Oh, I, you you're yeah. you're already hooked up. So the patient came to me um, because he had gone to um, a, a military sign-up to try to get a, uh, into the Marines, and they did a whole battery of bloods on him, which interestingly included um, initially a glu fasting glucose, which was 105. So they said, well, we'd like do a glucose tolerance test to see if we're willing to let that slip. It was abnormal. So then they sent him, they told him, go see a doctor. So he came to see me. He was only 23 years old. So I did autoantibodies, and his GAD came back greater than a thousand positive. So that your question's a really important one because the trouble about type stage two, type one diabetes is how are we going to find them? That was sheer blind luck, um, but it's unusual. And we have, we'd have to have a screening program, I think, to find them. Yeah, that's what we're grappling with right now as we gear up to wanting to give the medicine is who are we going to, how are we going to identify these individuals? Yeah, uh, yeah. we're having the same discussion. We thought maybe that we would send a, like something out to all our patients with type one saying, if you have relatives with type one who'd like to be screened, there's this, the JDRF provides a thing where they can prick their finger and get a great buck. So I think they can get their autoantibodies. Thank you, Peter. That was a, a great talk. I think that the concept of neonatal beta cell mass is really important in selecting, you know, who's going to be at risk of diabetes later in life, especially when they're exposed to some a specific, uh, you know, uh, environmental effects. But, and you mentioned genetics, but when you look at the GWAS, only, you know, 8% or 10% of the susceptibility to diabetes can be detected in GWAS. And then the question is, what is this other risk? Where is the other risk coming? And, and one of the things that I was gonna mention is how the nutrient environment during pregnancy can be a major determinant in that not only neonatal uh, beta cell mass, but, but also it, during the first two decades of life worth, as you show, right. is where you achieve your end of, you know, your target beta cell mass. Yeah, no, I mean, you have a very good point. If you look at places that had the so-called big jump in epidemics of diabetes, China and India, they're the populations that have gone from being relatively impoverished and rural to moving into urban environments. So mom, uh, in, a, in a rural environment was malnourished, had a baby. The baby um, didn't get much to eat in infancy and then moved into big city and is now sitting in front of a computer screen so that when you phone to complain about the fact your iPhone is not working properly, uh, this person is the one answering you, uh, is very sedentary and very jet lagged because it's eight hours out of, and is, is trying to, so this is the sort of perfect storm for having a lousy intrauterine environment and postnatal and now having the ultimate Western diet and sedentary life. And not surprisingly, there's been a huge jump in type two diabetes in those very, urbanization is the single biggest risk of type two diabetes in China and India. So I think you're absolutely right. I think the 8% is a bit hard on GWAS because I think the, what we're coming to understand, it's not any individual gene, but it's the interaction between genes. So if you have genet genetics that makes your threshold for capacity of folding proteins a little lower, Plus, you have a gene that made you didn't quite make enough beta cells when you were in that expansion phase. Plus, you maybe didn't have quite so many chaperones that were good for your... It's the interaction between genes we need to realize. And we don't know how to do those interactomes yet. But at some point, when we get that figured out, but maybe the genome studies will be more discriminatory. Well, Dr. McKenzie would be proud that you were chosen to be his, in his name, the lecturer today, not only because of the many references that you made to him, which he always likes to hear, 
but also <laughs> um, the, the the fact that you yourself are such an accomplished contributor to this field and led us to much of our understanding of the role of uh, islet cell numbers, uh, beta cell numbers within the islet. So thank you very much, Peter. Thank you everyone for participating in today's hybrid grand rounds and I wish everybody a safe day. <laughs>